It looked like something Jimmy Carter acolytes created after locking themselves in a bunker with a Commodore PET computer, the Tupperware collection for 1981, and a laser disc of the movie Tron. But the Volt worked, delivering both electric vehicle stealth and internal combustion freedom. It may have missed the energy crises for which it was perfectly suited, but its timing was still propitious. The 77,000 or so units that Chevy sold, the majority in California, thoroughly expunged the mark of cane borne by General Motors ever since it was accused of killing the electric car. The Volt II proves that GM's novel idea for an Enviro hybrid has cleared the tower of experimentation and is on for power descent into a regular product line with a history and a sustaining business case. Could we finally see the Volt give birth to a family of vehicles, at least, besides a Cadillac Coupe? Given the public's current fascination with small crossovers, surely GM must have a little SU Volt in the works. Either way, the new Volt styling makes a 30-year thematic leap to contemporary windswept sensuality, and the interior is no longer something out of the Apple catalog C1999. The silly touch-sensitive capacitive controls are gone, replaced by a mosaic of conventional push-button set in a pleasingly organic fan of interior plastics and complemented by an elegantly integrated infotainment screen. No doubt some Volt FOC will lament the car's reach toward design normalcy, toward looking a lot more like a Honda Civic. But the car both looks and functions a lot better, especially since GM makes a terrific effort to cater the car's controls to the needs of F buyers and especially their hypermiling radical elite. And Volt lovers can rejoice that the basic four-door hatchback envelope is essentially unchanged, with just about a half inch inserted in the wheelbase and 3.3 inches added overall, mainly for styling and to give your seat passengers a little more legroom. Indeed, the frontal area and claim drag coefficient of 0.28 are essentially as they were before. While the car grows, its weight shrinks, our loaded premier tester tallying 3,396 pounds against 3,766 for our last Volt test car. That triumph means the Volt effectively eliminates the mass gap with its arch rival, the Toyota Prius plug-in, and greatly narrows it against the regular Prius. Much of the Volt's excess cottage cheese came off the electric drive unit, 99 pounds, and battery pack, 31 pounds, which is where the most profound changes to Volt II are found. GM's marching orders from its customers were clear, give us more range in EV mode, make the engine quieter, and give the car more driving spunk. The old powertrain, which paired an iron block 1.4 liter four-cylinder to one large propulsion Regan motor generator and one smaller multi-purpose electric machine, got a complete rethink. Now, a more powerful Atkinson Cycle 1.5-liter aluminum block engine works in concert with two smaller motor generators, housed inside a transaxle to drive the differential through a chain rather than gears as before. Engineers studied a range of engines, from a 1.0-liter turbo three-cylinder to the 1.5, and selected the largest because of the fact that Corvette owners have long known, a bigger engine turning more slowly can be remarkably efficient. And quiet. And quicker, if need be, since the bigger engine doesn't need to call on the motors as much when the driver floors it. The long, 86.6 mm, 3.41 inch, stroke makes the Volt's lump a sort of automotive tugboat engine, a low-speed torque machine with its 101 horsepower arriving at just 5,600 revolutions per minute. A T-shaped battery pack still lies under the 12-center tunnel, but its capacity climbs from 17.1 kWh to 18.4, with fewer but larger liquid-cooled prismatic lithium-ion cells to generate more power from a lighter but slightly larger package. The new transaxle houses two electric motors with 31% less combined power and 28% less torque than before, three clutches, and two planetary jersets. 
five propulsion modes are available. As long as energy is available from the battery pack, the roll drives on one or both electric motors. When the charge is depleted, one of the motors cranks the engine to begin extended range operation. Manipulating the clutches provides three distinct ranges for accelerating, cruising, and high-speed driving, with the motor generators participating in propulsion and battery charging roles. As in the original Volt, the electric motors also charge the battery during deceleration, reckon. Chevy claims a 19% reduction in the 0 to 30 mph time, the jibes with a measurement of 2.6 seconds for the new car versus 3.2 seconds before. The old Volt took 8.8 .8 seconds to hit 60, the new Volt takes 7.8 seconds. The original was said to provide around 40 miles of electric driving, Volt I comes with a 53 mile claim. In two complete drains of the battery during normal driving, we saw 52 and 56 miles. Unfortunately, GM wouldn't leave the car with us long enough to get a thorough fuel economy test. Further testing to follow at a later date, but, as you know, the Volt doesn't yield a simple fuel economy number because it depends entirely on the way you operate it. Drive it less than 50 miles per day and recharge overnight, as most Volt owners do, actually, 41 miles per day is the average, says GM, and the 87 octane gas in the tank will just slosh around unused, the engine nothing more than a couple hundred pounds of dead weight. Unless you command it to do otherwise, the Volt runs on electric power until it depletes the usable portion of the battery, and then seamlessly switches to a combination of gasoline and electricity. We did manage to get in a 120 mile run in this combined engine electric mode with mixed traffic and road types, and it yielded a Prius like 48 miles per gallon. Suffice it to say, the Volt is thrifty. It's also livelier, with a strong pull from a prodded gas pedal, and has reliable brakes and accurate if not thrilling steering. The Michelin Energy Saver tires supply quite an adequate grip, but only to a fairly low threshold of 0.80 grams. Bank robbers won't be looking here. As promised, the Volt is quiet even with the plugs firing, unless you really draw the battery down by, say, running nine successive quarter miles, or by climbing a mountain. When it needs to run hard, the 1.5 buzzes with labored effort, a noise especially apparent when you come to a red light. Most engines are at their quietest then, but the volts can be cranking away in a frenzy, charging the battery. It's one of the peculiar idiosyncrasies of this powertrain, but GM claims that the Volt II falls into these charging holes less often than Volt I, so it's a rare occasion. At its highest speeds, the engine vibrations in our early test car found something sympathetic in the body to rattle, producing a clattery duet. You can tell that GM closely studied the way F drivers operate their vehicles. It's all about energy management, and Volt II gives you lots of control. For example, the four driving modes include Normal, Sport, and Mountain, which cuts the ever only range to preserve the battery for expected long climbs, plus Hold, which lets you save the battery for whenever you want F miles. Those modes carry over from the Gen 1 Volt, but even handier is a new Regan paddle on the back of the steering wheel, which turns a clunky hypermiling technique done with the shifter in many Fs into a simple fingertip function. Most Fs offer some kind of max Regan mode, but you usually have to shift into low or B to engage it, then shift back to D for normal acceleration. The Volt makes it much easier. The paddle only works when you lift off the gas, engaging maximum regeneration. In many daily situations, the paddle cuts the car speed enough to provide all the deceleration you need and it will even stop the car completely. Which means the friction brakes, those energy squandering devices from the smokestack era, can be used less often in favor of the paddle, which pulls electrons back into the battery.
The rest of the cockpit does its share of plain black plastic but is laid out with pleasing hints at pseudo grandeur. Mercedes could take a lesson from the artful integration of the central touchscreen into the dash. Apple CarPlay was working on our car with an iPhone, though, as we've already reported, the functionality is limited. The driver's instruments are displayed on another multicolor screen with four selectable configurations, though really two with two minor variations of each. Nothing from the old Volt's display is carried over, and the navigation map can now be echoed in a small window below the speedometer, though without a separate zoom function. Rear seat riders will have to duck under the sloping roof to enter. Chevy now fits a middle seat belt but adds no legroom, so the necessarily short person there must straddle the battery as if riding a Shetland pony. Chevy offers the Volt in two trims, the base starting at $33,995 and our Premier, with leather seats, Bose stereo, and heated front and rear seats, starting at $38,345. Get the Vorius safety packages and you're over $40,000, which means you could alternatively be driving something from a German luxury brand. The Volt, however, even in its relatively voluptuous new body, plays to folks less motivated by crass materialism, even if their object of desire bears the same price.